Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the episode filmed before the episode after it. It's whatever it is. Episode 426, I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today is August 10th, 2018. As often happens in the crazy world of Anglican Unscripted, uh, life happens. I have work calls, George has church stuff, Gavin has travel stuff, and so it's hard always to get our schedules perfect. In fact, we recorded half of uh, Anglican Unscripted 426, and boom, I had to take a phone call. George had to go run some errands. Gavin called in afterwards, so we recorded... Dunkin' Donuts, major important errands. That is an errand. I hope you got some glazed donuts with that. Uh, only two chocolate glaze. Chocolate glaze. Ooh, yes. And so Gavin called in and I recorded 427. But we will put this out first and we'll put out 427 tomorrow. That's just the crazy life we lead in the Anglican world. George, tell me a little bit about your health. For people who don't remember, George, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, you were in the hospital for a week. You have sepsis. They loaded you up with antibiotics, finally sent you home. But recovering from sepsis is difficult. Two things to report. One, I have now reached my out-of-pocket and deductible limits. Yay! So <laughs> if I want to have open-heart surgery tomorrow, it's covered. It's free. free. It won't cost me a thing. <laughs> In the meantime, I've got about five or $6,000 of bills on my desk that need to be paid. So mm. that's half of it. Yeah. The second is... Um, I'm not still not well. It's going to take a long time, and they don't tell me what a long time means. <laughs> no. uh, I have very little energy. Um, I my brain will work, and I can think of all the things that I need and want to do. But I'll sit down on my desk, and I'm not productively using my time. Um, uh, it's like I I'll see I look out my window, and I'll see a squirrel, and I'll spend the next half hour looking at the squirrel. Uh, forgetting that I've got something in front of me that needs to be done now. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we're getting old, George. Spare parts, doctor bills. You know. Now I, I can't complain because my parents probably go to a doctor of some sort uh, three or four times every two weeks, but twice a week they're going to some doctor, whether it's the general doctor, the knee doctor, the ankle doctor. Um, as you age, you if you had the right health insurance you just go to doctors and you could live longer well i have good health insurance it's mm -hmm. through the episcopal church and it's an excellent insurance but you still have to pay your 20 percent out That's of pocket right. yeah. and usually it does you know i've never ever reached well that's not true it's been years it's, it's, since i have ever hit the the uh maximum out of pocket Mm. Um, no, I, but I'm so I, but I'm much I'm so fortunate because that I do have good insurance because I know people who have insurance that their battle pocket is eight thousand ten thousand. It's just a difficult time for some people. It is. I remember you know the, some of the changes of Obamacare and uh, I don't know if people remember, but a couple of years ago I had a, a real bad case of type two diabetes and I was on a lot of insulin. Uh, and it was expensive up to the point where it was seven, eight hundred bucks a month, and it didn't take any time at all to hit the deductible. So, yeah, glad those days are over. George, let's move on to the news. Um, I want to do a compare and contrast here between America and England and uh, um, get into that. America was founded by pilgrims, Puritans, frontiersmen, people who at one time said they were sick and tired of where they lived and were going to find another place, an unknown place, a new country. They would lead with you know pennies in their pocket. Well, if they came from a different country, it wasn't pennies, but you, you get the, the, the idea here. They were people who uh, were fed up or wanted a new opportunity. They hopped on boats and came over here to America and established a new nation um, over time. That's frontiersmen. That's the, the type of descent. I'm a descendant of frontiersmen. George is a descendant of frontiersmen. We think and react a little differently to the people back in Europe who um, stayed and are descendants of those who stayed uh, in place, 
fought the wars, lived through the, the battles, uh, lived through the different kings and um, uh, monarchies throughout history. And they were willing to um, endure more than my ancestors or George's ancestors. Um, and their boiling points are different. And I remember you telling me a story about your father's boiling point um, uh, in certain situations. He was in a church service with a bishop and stood up and called the bishop a heretic. Yeah, it must be something genetic because 400 years ago, my family, well, in four years, yes. it'll be the 400th anniversary of my family uh, leaving England because they were mad at the bishops of the Church of England. Uh, well, that anger, I guess, got carried over the United States. Because 30 years ago, my father was sitting in the pew with my mother at the church, uh, Good Shepherd, what was it? Church of the Good Samaritan, Good Samaritan. Episcopal okay. Church outside of uh, Philadelphia. And Charles Benison, the Bishop of Philadelphia, was giving a sermon, and he made the line that Jesus is a sinner just like you and me. And my father, who is not the most demonstrative uh, person, he doesn't get involved in theological arguments. He doesn't, that's not his thing. He stood up in the middle of the sermon and he said, You, sir, are a heretic. Leave! And now, my mother's having heart failure. Sure. Because, you know, you just don't interrupt a bishop in an Episcopal service and tell him to leave. And she's like, she's trying to pull him down. Uh, now, needless to say, Benison gave me a lot of grief when I, because I was in the ordination process at the time. But he cut his sermon short and sat down. So... Uh, I guess maybe genetically we have a thing about fighting bad bishops, <laughs> but that uh, independent streak is not universal. Let me I'll give you a little uh, vignette from the Gafcon conference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some English friends told me that they, I am quintessentially American. Uh, I don't know why that's a bad thing. Uh, I don't, uh, that's a compliment, by the way. Okay. I think, yeah. No, I don't think it was a compliment. I don't think it was a compliment. We were, I was with, I was the only American at a table full of Englishmen and, uh, well, there was a Scotsman as well. And it was about 11 at night and we were at the uh, hotel uh, uh, bar chatting and the Israel is not a service economy. Waiters, waitresses, they do a pretty poor job. Yeah. They don't, that's not what they do. That's not the ethos or whatever. And we wanted to get some more snacks and a round of drinks and a bottle of wine. And the waitress was spending her time chatting to the bartender and wouldn't, you know, saw, and she saw people waving and she wouldn't do anything. So I got up with, the bottle, with an empty bottle, walked up to her and said, do you speak English? And she said, yes. I said, well, I want another one of these now. And uh, send the waiter over to take some food orders. And so she did. And the people at the table, the English people are going, oh, my God, like I'd taken my pants off in public. <laughs> she, and I was told I was just so American because I didn't put up with crap. I didn't take it. And the what we from, and in America, there are different levels of t putting up with crap. Mm -hmm. You don't mess with Texas, as no. our friends from that state <laughs> tell us. Um, but what would cause outright revolution in the United States causes annoyance in England. Yeah, and, and so when you have someone like our friend Gavin, who I actually be, act out of very poor taste and object publicly and speak the truth to power and do what is right for the gospel's sake, not only is he violating church order, he's behaving badly yeah, in public. That's right. You know, and so the so I guess where we're coming from this is post Gafcon. Uh, post Gafcon one, uh, the fuse was lit. Acna took off, blew up. At Gafcon three, fuse is lit, and it's sputtering. AMIE is going nowhere. Yeah. The English just have not reached the boiling point, where they just are not going to take it anymore. They're going to continue to take it. Yeah, I, I see not that. All of them, not all of them. Not all but, of them. I, I, I see the struggle. I mean, I guess you could consider Bob Duncan or Clint Eastwood, you know, our, our cowboy frontiersman. And was Clint Eastwood is about a foot taller than Bob foot Duncan. Taller. <laughs> He's got that thing uh, with his eyes. Eyebrow. <laughs> Clint, you know? Clint's eyebrows were always rather, you know, crisp and trim. But he, yes, he, I see your point. You no, know, he yeah. he's our cowboy, our, our Clint Eastwood, you know. Uh, 
uh, and uh, was able to certainly conquer and inform the ACNA uh, by herding kittens. Um, and I don't see that same thing happen in England, but I was interested in a story that made the press uh, where a church in Scotland has decided they've had it, they're going to leave, leave the church of uh, the Episcopal Church of Scotland, and they're done. And you did some investigating, and it's not the first time they left. And for us foreigners, <laughs> Scotland is not England. No. I know for people in England, that's not that's a no-brainer. <laughs> but for us foreigners, way foreigners. over here, yeah, huh? um, the Scottish mindset is very different. Uh, just. St. Thomas's in Edinburgh, That's right. David McCarthy's the rector, they had an article in the Telegraph uh, last Sunday reporting that they had voted to leave the Scottish Episcopal Church. Now, this vote took place in May, so it was a little late in making it down to London to make into the newspapers. What? But, <laughs> the Telegraph is broken or something? <laughs> well, no, they, they, it was the Tom Tom, Daily <laughs> Tom Tom, not the Jerry. Had to go by dr smoke signal and drum beat down to London. <laughs> Now, to do, see, in St. Thomas's was formed in 1844 in the Drummond Schism in the Scottish Episcopal Church when evangelical clergymen said, we're sick of the Anglo-Catholics running the Sc Scottish Episcopal Church, we're going to go our own way with our own bishops from England. And St. Thomas's was independent for over 120 years. It finally came back into the Scottish Episcopal Church, I think in the 1960s, maybe. I may have the date wrong, but within 10 years or so. And now it's that same mindset to say, the hell with you. We're not going to go to hell because you are. St. Thomas has pulled out again. So they're acting There's like the Americans tiny, then. Yeah, well, they're acting like angry Scotsmen. Yeah. Um, we met a fellow from the Isle of Harris, uh, which is the uh, uh, Scottish equivalent of Alaska. Mm -hmm. I mean, the far, far outer islands off the coast where there are otters and sheep and uh, seagulls. And their little church, you know, withdrew, and they all withdrew en masse. And they've, I think, you know, had, they had to meet in a pub for a while. They built this church themselves until somebody else gave them a place. But the Scots, there are much fewer of them, Anglicans, but they, those who are of act in a mind, if you will, are more ready to act sure. than their English contemporaries. This is a gross generalization. There are people who have acted in England. Yes. But Scotland is the few if the boiling point is lower. It's like America. The boiling point is lower. Where the boiling point in England is pretty high. Per very high. Very you know, they have not added salt to their water. The boiling point is you know, extremely high. Um, I did want to follow up. Last time you and I spoke, we talked about Pope Francis. And uh, we were kind, very kind, compared to some of the commentaries I read about what Pope Francis uh, uh, spoke of when he wanted to change the teaching and the uh, catechism on the... Capital punishment. Uh, capital punishment. I, I wanted to add you know, a couple adverbs to that, but capital punishment. And so, uh, in doing so, he got a, a, a big st a storm brewing. The liberals were happy. The conservatives unhappy. Uh, typical. And I, I wanted to do a follow-up because a lot of people said, we were wrong. We took his uh, statements out of context. We don't know what we're talking about. Uh, how would an Anglican know what a pope wanted to say or mean anyway? And I said, oh, I better talk to George. George, well, were we wrong? No, we were absolutely right. Okay. Um, most people go through life happy in their own ignorance. Uh, they have uh, confirmation bias. They know what they know and they hear what they want to hear that confirms what they're thinking. Sure. Um, if you think I was harsh about Pope Francis, read some of the traditionalist Catholic blogs in the past few weeks. They have gone bananas. I don't... Uh, my logic is akin to, but it's not identical to theirs. Uh, so essentially the, the issues that I raised were uh, are the issues that they raised. Now I do have some Catholic training. Before I went to Yale I studied with the Augustinians at Villanova for two years and, and at Yale my theology professor was a man named Avery Dulles. He was a Jesuit. He's the uh, Cardinal. Huh? Cardinal Dulles. Huh? 
he wasn't a cardinal then, and he would come up from Fordham in New York City two days a week, and he would teach theology in graduate courses, and he we would have lunch uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays at Maury's, which is one of the eating clubs, and he was working very hard to recruit me and a few other young men to become Catholics. He, he had a mission at Yale Divinity School, which is to bring some of the people to the true faith. And one of these issues that we discussed at great length with papal authority and the death penalty and all these things. So about 30 years ago, I went through all these discussions. I was not persuaded uh, to become a Catholic. Um, so Susan is my wife, not my housekeeper. <laughs> That's right. uh, but the, the issue is that uh, people said that, you know, John Paul II said, death penalty had to be very, 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 very rare and seldom. Therefore, like, like it's no... Like our president says abortion should be. Or previous well, our president. former, our former. previous president. Yep. Well, there's a tremendous, tremendous category shift when you say something is rare to be almost non-existent to it's impermissible has all, and is wrong morally. And when something is wrong morally, that means it's wrong at all times and in all places for all peoples. And, and previously wrong, just not not just wrong now, but it was always mm -hmm. wrong. And so what Francis has done, and this is the argument traditional Catholics are putting forward, and this is the argument that Protestant critics of Catholicism are putting forward, is that Francis has unilaterally, or Francis and his supporters, have decided that dogma develops according to their lights and to their speed not according to the magisterium of the church. See, the doctor, in the Catholic Church, we have the doctors of the faith, uh, who, um, and if they're saints, they're almost all saints as well. Aquinas, Augustine, uh, Hilary, um, Epiphanius, and each, every single doctor of the church who wrote on the issue of capital punishment says it's morally licit, meaning it is permissible. They disagreed amongst themselves as to the frequency of its use. Some were like John Paul II saying very sparingly, if at all, ever. For, for Francis to say that the doctors of the church were wrong, which is what he is saying when you say it is now impermissible, you're basically, by one man's fiat, one man's actions, changing the doctrine and dogma of the church. Sister Helen Pergine, who I believe, I think it's Helen, who is that, uh, uh, there was a movie with Sean Penn, got Dead Man Walking. Sure, she was Dead Man uh, Walking, yep. She's an she's a anti-death penalty activist, she's a Catholic nun. She was interviewed, she's overjoyed about this, and she said, why am I overjoyed? I said, if he can do it, Francis can do it here, he can do it about other stuff, like homosexuality, like divorce and remarriage, like women clergy. If Francis can do this on this issue, he can do it on any of these contested issues. And this is the argument the traditionalists are saying, if he can do it here, he's going to do it elsewhere. Whereas George, the, uh, George, the hardcore uh, Episcopalian, is saying, look, you guys are going down a path that we Episcopalians have been down, mm. which is 50% plus one changes the Every, dogma yeah. of the church. That's right. Deploy and your that's airbags. that's no way to run a church. That's <laughs> well, no way to run a church. It's interesting because early on in, in uh, his popleness, uh, you and I conjectured that this is the probably the one guy who could probably offer an open table solution uh, to the Eucharist and stuff like that, that he was open-minded enough to, to help break down the, the, the boundaries and walls to other denominations and there would be, you know, uh, a little bit of peace uh, with the Roman Catholics. Now, well, uh, post-GAFCA, and I talked to a lot of people um, in the conservative and orthodox realms, nobody wants to touch Rome now with a 10-foot pole. Nobody wants to talk to, uh, and deal with uh, the Pope's peoples unless you're Episcopal and you want to do Arctic, but... Uh, uh, there's just no need to work further with Rome. We're done for now until there's another pope or until they change. Well, let me tell you a little Archic story that just came out. Uh, Archic, which is the Anglican Roman Catholic International Consultation. This is the third round. Yes. They've done two whole series. Now, it basically came to a stop when the Anglican world started with women clergy and mm -hmm. the shifting boundaries on homosexuality. Well, 
they re they've done another series just to keep things moving. But the Arctic team on both sides, Anglicans and Catholics, represent a very narrow slice. Friends of Justin, friends of Josiah Dao Ferron, and people in Francis's uh, coterie. So it doesn't represent if Anglicanism. It doesn't represent the breadth of Catholicism. However, there were some holdovers on the Catholic team, and there was this one woman professor, and she was involved in Arctic, but she, but she disagreed with some of the conclusions. And one of them was the head of the Arctic on the Catholic side said, well, yes, we think we can learn from the Anglicans too, and one of those areas we can learn from is women deacons. Not deaconesses, but women deacons. And it is permissible within the Catholic world to have women deacons, and we've picked this up from the Anglicans. Now, this Catholic lay theologian, the woman, said, "We didn't. Do, th wait, what are you? Wait, wait, wait. I, <laughs> what are I, you talking I, about? Was <laughs> I getting pizza that that meeting? Or what, where are you going with this?" So the same sort of little games that we see played by Canterbury and by the Anglican Consultative Council, they're played by the Vatican's Curia. Mm -hmm. uh, to basically slip in changes that uh, mesh with the current secular Western European liberal mindset. Um, so hear me again, I am not anti-Catholic, far from it. I have great respect for Catholicism. There are a lot of Catholics who I do not think of, but their heads screwed on right. And I think there are a lot more Episcopalians, because I know more Episcopalians, yeah. whose heads are definitely not screwed on right. It comes down to how do we understand the revealed knowledge? How do where does revelation come from? Sure, scripture, our tradition, reason, or does it come from the fact that the man in charge, or the committee in charge, says, "Okay, black is now white. Do what we say." That's right. I mean, that's a difficulty. You know, church, as far as I've seen in the last four hundred years, it's a changing. And uh, well, it's you know, yeah. not changing for the better. I have to say, Kevin, some of my critics have, have accused me of a lack of humility on this issue. And that's a fair charge. I, I think I'm bright. Uh, I think I know it all. Uh, for 20 years, people have paid me to be a know-it-all to write about Anglican world. And, but part of that lack of humility is that I get very irritated when I hear and listen to these church commissions and committees tell me how to do evangelism, tell me how to plant churches, tell me how to grow churches, when not a single one of them has done it. They've wonderful on theory, but they've never actually done it and seen it work in practice. Mm -hmm. And part of the, the ACNA for me as an Episcopalian was a tremendous tragedy because it saw the departure of I'll just pick some names. People like David Roseberry and John Guernsey, men and who were phenomenal pastors who could who could grow churches night and day, and and they're doing that in the ACNA world, and there are few of us, few of us now left in the Episcopal world are doing that, but the Episcopal world and the Church of England world and the Anglican world is telling us this is how you grow a church, this is how you do reconciliation, this is how you do. This is how you read the Bible. Yeah. And, folks, I don't think I'm reading the same book as they are. No, according to Anglicanism, the best way to build a church is to create martyrs. You know, it's just... It's all oh, backwards now, George. The, the world has just well, gone crazy. Actually, no, Kevin. The world has reached... What is that? The thermal equilibrium? Yes, is that a, yeah, that's a thing. Well, call Jill. Isn't she home today? You can ask her. She's yeah, the scientist. She's, you know what she's doing today? Jill and Joan, or Jill's twin sister, are doing museums today. <gasps> Thank God I got out of that. Oh. Well, but won't they take pictures of each of the exhibits and explain to the, you No, they're going to take pictures of the plaque explaining the exhibit they saw. Uh, that'll be fun. Well, the, in some respects, the news article came across the wires, the desk this morning saying that Justin Welby has been invited to address the UN on reconciliation. So, and I gotta tell you, my first instinct was, who is more pointless and ineffectual? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a competition. But then I thought, George, George, be nice. Remember our reading from the 
lectionary last week about be hu humble and gentle and kind and forbearance and patient in all things. Yeah. That applies to me. Well, this is, I would rather have Justin Welby busy himself with the United Nations than with the Anglican world. Because they, they'll buy what he's selling at the UN. Yep. Whereas no one in the Church of England is buying what he's selling. So he went to the most anti-Semitic organization uh, short of, you know, uh, Egypt, uh, Turkey, Iran, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and said, hey, I have some ideas for you. Oh, boy. George, we've done our 20 minutes of entertainment for the week. Uh, any good plans this weekend? Oh, yeah, you're a priest. you got to do your sermons. How many sermons do you guys a, do on Sunday now? Well, i got a funeral tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, at, and then, so that's a sermon. That's a homily. Yeah. Saturday at 5, 8 o'clock. Class at nine fifteen, sermon at ten thirty, sermon at one thirty, sermon at five. And they've got to be different because we get people go to one more than one's class or service, and so I've got to. Yeah, yeah, they got, I've got to mix it up. They're you know. going to pay attention. Um, oh look, tomorrow I got a busy schedule too. Uh, when I get up, I go for a little bike ride, and then it's beach day. Beach day. Beach day. Across the street. It's rough. It means it's suntan lotion day. I stink when I pile of lotion on. George, I want to thank you for your time. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 426 of Anglican Unscripted.